Hi there, Jonathan here. The following talk is offered freely to ensure that no one is ever denied access to these practices and to these teachings. If you feel inspired to make a donation to support this offering, you can go to my website where you can also sign up for a monthly newsletter designed to support you in your practice. That's www.jonathanfaust.com. Thank you and enjoy. So I'm, I'm aware of not wanting to recycle my jokes too closely. <laughs> so I try to keep it maybe once a year. I know I've shared this before, but it's kind of apropos to the topic tonight. The story of uh, after a psychology lecture, a young woman came up and to ask to speak to the professor. And she said, uh, excuse me, Professor, but could you tell me what a Freudian slip is? And the professor says, well, yes, it's, it's when you, you say one thing, but then you say something else instead. And he goes, oh, okay. Well, I said, well, well, why do you ask? Did this happen to you? And she said, well, yeah, I think so. Uh, I went home for the holidays and was having dinner with my family, and I... I said, I meant to say to my mother, please pass the butter. But instead I said, I hate you, I hate you, you ruined my life. <laughs> Sometimes there are, there are hidden forces <laughs> underneath that we're not quite aware of. And that's the topic for tonight. Last week, uh, we talked about equanimity as part of the, the tenth of the ten perfections, as really considered kind of the flower of the practice. And, and equanimity is kind of even beyond happiness. It's just a state of presence that, that, is, that is so steady that no matter what is happening externally, no matter what fluctuations of the mind, there's this quality of presence that's there. So it can endure through, through any change whatsoever. And that's part of the practice, and that's what we're cultivating. So when you notice the mind wandering and you bring it back, it gets developed through concentration. You develop that through being the observer, the non-judging observer. You develop that through your capacity to surrender to the flow of your life. And it's... Uh, it's a wonderful thing to cultivate, and yet there is there are all these forces that are under the surface, and it's very important that we not bypass those, that we actually include them in our practice of awakening. So I like to say, if you want to be fully awake, then you have to see where you're not awake. So on Saturday, um, I was immersed in a day-long retreat here, which was a, a really, really wonderful day. It was so sweet to be with like-minded people in a really loving and supportive space. Everyone was so kind and thoughtful. And, and I forgot all about the events in Charlottesville until I got home. And, and I just forced myself to look at the at the photos uh, and the images. And the contrast was quite stark, was quite stark from such a place of feeling safe and um, a really beautiful collective to really see <clears throat> such vitriol and, and such uh, an expression of hatred. And so this ties into the talk, which is kind of entitled Meditating with a Shadow. How do you be with a shadow? all these unfelt and unseen energies and feelings that will arise when you pay attention. So what I'd like to talk about is, is our relationship to the shadow, how the shadow appears, and how you can work with the shadow in your practice. 
And then just a few thoughts on how we work with the shadow in community. Primarily, I'll be talking about the shadows through really looking at this through the lens of your personal practice and sharing some of my own experiences. These unseen, unfelt forces are there all the time, but we're not aware of them. The analogy, again, that I use over and over and over again, but it's so apt, is to imagine a big circle with a horizontal line through the circle. Above the circle is what you're aware of. Below the circle is what you're not aware of. When you relax and pay attention and cultivate non-judging awareness, the line moves. You begin to become aware of what was previously hidden. And that is the, the magic of, of the practice, the magic of becoming more awake to reality in your life. <clears throat> A friend told me this story, which was quite wrenching. His sister had been troubled her, her whole life, and it was a, quite a challenge for, for everyone. He had a pretty big family. It was quite disruptive, very unstable um, house, and no one understood why she was so unhappy and acting out in, in um, sometimes pretty dramatic ways. Uh, both parents were very responsible, very loving, caring people. She um, got married, and she had a baby. And for some reason that no one could understand, she would not let anyone touch the baby. And she would not even let anyone in the room with the baby unless she was in the room. As you can imagine, with all that hypervigilance, she got more and more exhausted and really needed help. And she finally it got so chronic that she, she agreed to get some help and started to work with, a, work with a therapist and uncovered memories of being sexually abused by a family member. And she, of course, had transferred that hypervigilance to her daughter. And once that was understood, everything changed in the family dynamic. That's an extreme example. But there are strong and unseen and unfelt energies that can run our lives. What Buddhist psychology says is that there, there are three fundamental forces that shape and inform your actions. In their most extreme, they show up as, as hatred and greed and delusion. We're all familiar with these. Greed is, is wanting and grasping, being caught in desire, always externally focused for something out there that is going to make you happy. The forces of, of, of aversion are all about judgment and anger and blame and all about self-protection, a reinforcing of this kind of tightly held self. And delusion is a kind of confusion. Now, the classic way to think of delusion is when you believe certain things are true and they are not, or you believe certain things aren't true and they are. So the times when you're caught in delusion and confusion, it's like it's a groundless place. You're, you're, you're spinning. You're just lurching from one place to the next. And of course, we all experience this. Classic Buddhist psychology describes them as the three poisons. When, when your mind is poisoned by, by greed and desire and craving, it is impossible to be present. There is no capacity to see clearly. When you're caught in self-protection and aversion and holding the world out there, self-preservation, 
again, you're not alive, you're not free. And when you're lost in confusion, it's a terrifying place to be. So what happens is, when you begin to pause and you begin to cultivate non-judging awareness or mindfulness, you begin to see more clearly. You begin to see the reality of your life. As I like to say, you start to feel better. You feel your anger better, your disappointment better, your sadness better, along with your capacity for joy and compassion and kindness. Carl Jung described a shadow as um, that which we think we are not. That sense of, I would never do that. You know, this sense of sort of judging that occurs. And there's a tendency in spiritual practice to, to go for the light, you know, to go for the good stuff and not acknowledge what's actually present. I was in the Peace Corps for a number of years, and as I've mentioned many times, you know, lived in an ashram for many years, and I was catching up with a friend from the Peace Corps, and we hadn't talked in years. I said, well, I'm living in this ashram now. I said, yeah, I saw your catalog. It's that catalog where everyone is smiling in a really scary way. <laughs> And it was true. We were so focused on love and light and pixie dust. And it was just coming out of spiritual idealism. And it really brings up something that, that I think in, in our community, and I was certainly guilty of, it was called premature transcendence. So you're in the food line and someone cuts in on you. Oh, um, sure, yeah, go right ahead. It, it must be my karma or something that you're here to cut in and take care of yourself and ignore me. It must be, it must be my fault. And this could be a whole other talk, but uh, when our community, when our, when our ashram came crashing down, as many of the, the great ashrams did, there was an eruption of the shadow an unbelievable explosion of, of jealousies and rivalries and resentments that were all under the surface that we weren't willing to acknowledge. And these unseen, unfelt forces in, are in your life. They're steering your actions. And if you look closely and see, see them for what they are, you can begin to see more clearly into the nature of your life. And the paradox is not about doing. It's about just seeing them. As that phrase says, don't just do something, sit there. <laughs> the bad news is that these strong, unseen forces in your life are the product of your conditioning. You are you're conditioned for self-protection, your condition to find your way to avoid domination, etc., etc. The good news is that you can free yourself. You can increase your capacity to see into the nature of conditioning. It's a natural byproduct of this practice of mindfulness. And so, as you practice, the more aware you will become of those unseen forces. So a learning experience I had, and this is a little embarrassing, but as I was beginning to teach uh, meditation and to lead retreats, I was leading a retreat where there was a woman who would not close her eyes. And I was incensed, personally insulted. She was here for a meditation retreat. And, you know, I would invite people to close their eyes, and then she would open her eyes. And it got to the point where I would, I would stare her down. <laughs> you know, and then she'd close her eyes, and then I'd check back, and they were open, and she was looking around. And I got more and more frustrated with her. 
And as our retreat went on, she was acting out more and more. She was argumentative with me. Um, she was going to other, uh, other sessions in our community and getting into fights with the teachers. And finally, we kind of sat down to have it out. And, and I found out that she was a, a psychiatric nurse in a prison for mentally disturbed people. And suddenly I realized how much trauma she had. She couldn't close her eyes because it was too scary to close her eyes. There was so much right there below the line that it was not safe for her to close her eyes. It deeply, deeply sensitized me to the trauma that we all have under the surface. So you might, if you like, um, you might just close your eyes for a moment. <laughs> I have my eye on you. <laughs> and if you don't want to close them, it's fine with me. Just a little reflection. You might take a moment and think of someone in your life you know who's suffering right now. Someone who's going through a hard time. And you might sense into the nature of that suffering. Is there a sense of of what they're wanting, what they're needing that's not happening? Is there a sense of, is, is the force in their life having to do with like craving and wanting? Is the force being caught in aversion or fear or pushing away? Is there a quality of confusion there? And you might, in your own way, Wish them well. Wish them ease and wish them peace. And as you're ready, you can deepen your breath. Trauma is a word that's thrown around a lot in our culture right now. The best way to think of trauma is the combination of fear and helplessness. That when you feel fear and you feel helpless, your nervous system immediately will move into self-protection. It'll either move into fight, into you know anger, aggression, ju aggression, judgment, blame or you'll move into flight, some form of disassociation. Or you move into freeze, just an, an inability to move, that kind of locked-in feeling. As we develop our capacity for mindfulness or non-judging awareness, we can increase our capacity to accompany ourselves when we feel fear and helplessness. There's something about the prefrontal cortex that gets developed. That is that capacity to be aware, to self-monitor, that when you feel fear, there's something in the mind that says, it's okay, you've been through this before, you can, be through the, you, you can get through this. But there are times when the prefrontal, prefrontal cortex is overwhelmed, when we get flooded, and we find ourselves simply, simply caught in fight or flight or freeze. a sign of the shadow or these unseen, unfelt energies arising is when you find yourself, sometimes they're early warning signs. Agitation, anger, judgment, blame, that pushing away. 
find yourself beginning to move into fantasy or thought, again, a quality of disassociation, spinning off into worry, or the paralysis that occurs when you're caught in doubt or when you feel that, that ruthless critic just paralyzing you. That's a sure sign that there's something arising in your experience. It's possible to be with them, but sometimes we're just gripped. When you're caught and gripped in these states, it's incredibly powerful. And this is where it's so important that we remember that there are practices that can be helpful. The acronym, which is quite often used, which we often refer to in this particular tradition is the acronym of RAIN, R-A-I-N. The R is to recognize or realize what's happening. And again, this is in meditation or in life. What is happening right now? Can you identify it clearly? Sometimes just recognizing it can be helpful. Oh, this is anxiety. Once you know what it is, your relationship to it might shift a little bit. But again, sometimes it can feel so strong and so overwhelming. And that moves you to the A of the acronym, where you can ask, can I allow this? Can I accept this moment as it is? And it's very important to acknowledge that sometimes when, when those unseen, unfelt energies, when the shadows are rising, sometimes you can't. And it's very strategic and skillful to let it know, not now, but another time when the conditions are different, your intention may be to be with it. But in those cases, you can shift your attention rather than to be flooded and overwhelmed. But if you can, then comes the, the practice of investigation to have tea with your demon. And that is a process of actually investigating intimately where do you feel it on the inside? What are you believing about this story? Is that belief true? And in that intimate investigation, it leads to the end of this acronym. And that is, if you can, to nourish what you find with empathy or compassion. The nourishing is the lubrication that allows you either to be with it or maybe to let it go. At a recent intensive I led, we were doing a, 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 breath, a breathwork experience, which was uh, can be very, very dramatic and very, very cathartic. And uh, oftentimes, for some people who have got undigested trauma, it, it comes to the surface. And as I was, uh, we set up the room, and we have blankets, and everyone lies in a blanket. We do this breathing technique. And um, one woman who was, uh, was raised in Lebanon, she walked in the room and saw the blankets and instantly thought, bomb shelter. I've been here before. In her circle was um, someone who had served in Iraq, who was in, who was in charge of, of um, the security for a very important part of, of uh, the diplomatic corps in Iraq at the worst time, who had sent people out, had lost people under his command. They were in the same circle. And during that breath work, what was so powerful and heartbreaking was they both were experiencing that deep, deep primal fear that was coming through their, right through their nervous system. And with it, the fear, but also the seeing it, the making room for it, allowing the tears, allowing the shaking to be there. And what touched me so deeply was, here was this, this, this little girl who was feeling like she was four years old in a bomb shelter, and this strapping, blue-eyed American 
military guy right next to each other having the same experience, the same trauma, and releasing it. We have that capacity. But again, if you want to be free, how badly do you want it? Here's a, a poem from Hafez. It's entitled, Tired of Speaking Sweetly. Love wants to reach out and manhandle us, break all our teacup talk of God. If you had the courage and could give the beloved his choice, some nights he would just drag you around the room by your hair, ripping from your grip all those toys in the world that bring you no joy. Love sometimes gets tired of speaking sweetly and wants to rip to shreds all your erroneous notions of truth that make you fight within yourself and with others causing the world to weep on too many fine days. God wants to manhandle us, look inside us, lock us inside a tiny room with himself, and practice his dropkick. The beloved sometimes wants to do us a great favor, hold us upside down, and shake all the nonsense out. But when we hear, he's in such a playful, drunken mood, most everyone I know, quickly packs their bags and hightails it out of town. I'm always so touched by the courage required to engage into this practice. The, the real refuge, I find, is to call back on your sincerity just the sincere desire to be, to be free, to be awake, to really know your true nature. But along the way, you will be exposed to everything that's between you and feeling free. So how does meditation support you when you're in this practice of releasing your shadow? Well, one thing that's very, very helpful is to develop your capacity for concentration and one-pointedness. It's a very important part of the practice to develop your capacity to stay. So when we have the anchor of the breath and doing walking meditation, you're doing one thing at a time. And what that does is it calms the mind and it trains your mind to be more present when the fluctuations of the mind arise. I always like to acknowledge uh, Eric Kolvig, who's now a retired Dharma teacher, who, who freely shares about his personal struggles in his life. But he, he teaches a form of walking meditation that, and that he says that will, will calm your mind within five minutes. And it's quite, it is true. And what you do is you count from one to ten as you walk. So you, but you count one, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. And whenever you lose count, you start over. So you have to get very, very concentrated. It's a very powerful technique. Someone was telling me how her, um, her eight-year-old daughter was having really, really strong anger issues. So she taught her daughter this technique. And so as she was doing the counting meditation, and then she said, how's it going? And then her daughter stopped and she said, Mommy, it worked. I can't find my anger. Concentration. Very, very powerful. Um, Pat Coffey, with whom I'll be leading the fall retreat, uh, works a lot um, in uh, prison for women. Lots of trauma. And they teach a technique of rocking. And in the rocking, they concentrate on the body, just rocking from side to side. And it's a way of soothing when you feel yourself caught in a mental and emotional turmoil. 
So concentration and one-pointedness, very, very powerful. Another technique that's very, very helpful are the loving-kindness practices. Just a pause and to, to wish yourself well, to wish yourself peace, to reflect on, on those who you know you love, your benefactors, those, those who you know are on your team, to wish them well. It's a lot easier. And the best way to start, of course, is with a dog or a cat because it just flows. And again, it's very, very powerful, very calming. Another technique is to cultivate gratitude. As has been said, that you cannot feel anger and gratitude at the same time. So but just by pausing and gladdening the mind to reflect on, on what you're grateful for, can kind of reset your whole system. Another thing that I find very helpful when I'm in my own process of, of struggle is whatever I'm going through to, to remind myself other people feel this too. And that is tremendously helpful. When you feel the grip of that shadow of fear or shame or embarrassment or humiliation, when you can remember that other people feel this too, it opens the frame. You're part of the human condition. Another helpful thing I find in my meditation practice, again, when I'm really caught in, in guilt or shame or self-judgment, is to remind myself that it may not be my fault. When you explore a, a belief or a strong emotion, you might ask, how old is this? Where might you have picked that up? As, as children, we pick up our conditioning like, like sponges. It's osmosis. A friend of mine saw his, uh, saw his son. He picked him up in um, day school. And his son was like talking to the other kids like this. And he's, he was horrified. He took his son aside. He said, that's wrong. You can't do that. And later in the day, he was saying, now look, you've got to get your... There it was. How much of your struggle is just... Did you just pick up without even being aware of it through your conditioning? So quite often, we tend to externalize our turbulence. We we look for the source. And quite often, it can be turning our attention to the experience. It's not so much what is happening, but how you're holding it on the inside. And a question I often find very helpful for myself. Again, when I feel that grip of the shadow, kind of the unfelt, unseen, when I become to be when I begin to become aware of it, to ask, how does this want me to be with it right now? How does this fear want me to be with it right now? And then listen. And sometimes I'll have a sense of a way I can hold that in a way that can create more internal healing. So in these final minutes, I wanted to share a little bit about the in community, the community shadow. When I looked closely at the images from Charlottesville, I couldn't help but experience a rush of feelings from shock to outrage to anger and then hopelessness and despair. And then seeing the efforts of those who are trying to present a positive statement and feeling touched by that. But when I looked at the, at the hatred and the anger, it seemed so tribal. And, and it all seemed so cynical as well. Knowing that, that both sides were going to take the images 
and spin them in their own way to show themselves as we are the holy ones and these are the these are the bad ones. And to be totally honest, I experience hate toward the hate groups. I wish them ill will. I judge them and I wanted them punished. And I hope that someone was identifying each one of these people and putting them on a watch list. And then I noticed that I was seeding hatred with hatred. And then I remembered a quote from the Buddha 2,500 years ago. And in the Buddha's time, he was surrounded by warring tribes. A lot of people think in the mythology of the Buddha that he was awakening and everything was peaceful. It wasn't. He had relatives who were trying to kill each other. Their, their, their discourses from the Buddha's time, and I, I won't have time to share, share them with you, but just really deep brutality. You know, again, this is in, in the, Buddha's, the, the mature period of the Buddha's life. The Buddha's teachings, of course, were around nonviolence. And he had this classic phrase where he said, hatred does not cease by hatred, but only by love. This is the eternal rule. 2,500 years ago. So the only recourse I had was to reflect on the suffering of everyone, everyone there and to sense the suffering of those who were so filled with hatred. And to acknowledge that I was feeling it too. That I was not free from hatred. So I don't call myself a Buddhist. I don't see any reason why I should. Um, I don't feel any need to affiliate with any group but I'm deeply informed by, by the principles and the teachings of Buddhism. And it's very, very easy to create an us-them consciousness. And Christianity, Islam, Judaism, they all speak of love reigning supreme and treating others as you would have them treat you. And of course, countless atrocities have been performed in the name of dogma. And Buddhism is no different. The Buddhist teachings are exceptionally clear around doing no harm, the teachings of karma. But you don't need to look very far to see that in Myanmar right now, a Buddhist country, there is a strong, hard-line group of nationalist monks who support genocide toward the Rohingya, who are, who are displaced refugees. They're either part of the violence or they, they wrote it and they incited it. And I think the essential problem is fundamentalism. As soon as we are caught in fundamentalism, if you disagree with me, then you are my enemy. And if we live inside that space, uh, we are locked in perpetual fear. So the question becomes, when we hold others in judgment and in contempt, we're feeding the shadow in ourselves. It's only when we acknowledge what is here and we seek to meet it with wisdom and compassion only then will something begin to shift. You begin to feel the pain behind the actions. And you begin to sense the unmet need. Wherever there is pain, there is an unmet need. And you sense how the other's leg is caught in a trap. So, this practice of becoming awake 
is all about your capacity to integrate the unseen, unfelt forces in your life. And I'll just close with a little story. I, I did a number of retreats with a Tibetan teacher by the name of Sokni Rinpoche. Really, really wonderful guy. Great sense of humor, very wise. And he was teaching a, per, a particular set of practices in the Dzogchen tradition, which is a, um, a more of an open awareness type practice. And, and I had uh, some really, really cool experiences. And I had an opportunity to, to talk with him. And I said, if I keep practicing these techniques, what can I expect? And I was so surprised by his answer. It really, it really surprised me. He looked at me and he said, confidence. He said, you will develop the confidence where you'll know you can be with anything. And I never forgot that. And I really believe no matter what the turmoil each of us experiences internally or how we get stimulated by all of our cultural strife right now, that there's something about these practices. If you can remember to cultivate wisdom, your capacity to see what's absolutely true, to move from your story, your preference, your embellishment, to see what's real. And you can cultivate compassion, the capacity to allow, to be with. Confidence ultimately begins to emerge in our practice. Why don't we take just a few, a few moments before we, before we close? You might take a moment to feel your breath. Notice where you feel the breath on the inside. And sensing in this moment these two wings of the practice that will lead you to not only an increased capacity for happiness and joy, but true freedom, the capacity to see clearly, to see the nature of reality, and your capacity for compassion. This quality of compassion has been described in the, in the Buddhist tradition as four qualities that are beyond measure. It might be nice to reflect on these for just a few moments. The first is kindness. And you might, with the breath, feel your capacity to be kind toward yourself and to all beings. The second quality is compassion. Your capacity to hold yourself with compassion and to offer that to all beings. The third is joy, your capacity to experience joy and to take joy at the joy of others. And the fourth is equanimity, a quality of steadiness no matter what is happening. And you might, in these moments, wish yourself well. Wish yourself peace. And let that offering radiate out to all beings without discrimination.
And as you're ready, you can deepen your breath. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes. Thank you so much for your kind attention and presence. Um, A few quick announcements. First, um, who needs a ride? Anyone need a ride?